summarize uh, for Samuel again, just, just to give you the, pi- the picture, the uh, concise picture of for Samuel. If you, if you just looked at the whole book, uh, chapters one through seven are essentially the story of the life of Samuel. And then when you get to chapter eight, chapter eight, which we're going to look at this morning, is really a transition chapter. It's a transition from the time of judges to the time of kings. And then chapters nine through the end of first Samuel, uh, so all the way to chapter 15, that really is a section of scripture that deals with the life of Saul, who was the first king of Israel. And this morning, again, we're in chapter eight, but before we jump into the text, I want to just tell you a story, one that many of you will be familiar with, or at least none of, none of you probably could say that you've never heard of this story. And in story time, this is perfect. There's no chance of you falling asleep during story time this morning. It's just too cold. It's just too cold. So um, there once lived a king who received an amazing gift, having found favor in the eyes of one of the gods in his particular pantheon of gods. Uh, This particular God, quote unquote, had come to King Midas and told the king that he could have any one thing that he wished for. It was interesting because the king didn't even hesitate. He knew exactly what he wanted. He wanted the ability to turn anything that he touched into pure gold. That was the king's deepest, deepest desire. Now, this particular God, though not the God, had wisdom enough to stop and advise King Midas to take a minute and think that request through just a little bit. But the king just didn't have any patience for that. He knew what he wanted. He assured him that the golden touch was exactly what he wanted. And and with that, the wish was granted. And in that moment of granting the wish, that, that God disappeared. And the king immediately reached out and he touched his throne. And instantly his throne became solid gold. Ecstatic, gleeful, he began racing around the palace, touching everything in sight and watching with utter delight as one thing after another began to shine with, with that gold glimmer. He, he, he went out into the outdoors and he went into his garden and he plucked a rose from a nearby bush. And at his touch, the delicate petals became hard and shiny. And it, and it gave him a moment's pause to see the harshness of what had been so delicate before. But he just shrugged his shoulders and went on inside to get something to eat. All of the turning things into gold had given him an appetite. So King Midas pulled up his golden chair to his now gold table, and he reached for some grapes, and he popped one in his mouth and nearly broke his tooth. He realized what he had done. The grape, and so he reached for an apple, but it was inedible. And suddenly, the realization washed over him, and he began to cry and sob. How would he even be able to eat or do the simplest of tasks? And he began to sob very loudly and and just just an ugly cry. You know what I'm talking about. He was crying, and, and and his little daughter happened to come into the room at the very moment he was sobbing, and she heard his cries, and she saw her daddy's sadness, and she was upset by her father sobbing, so she ran to him to hug him and comfort him, and the moment she touched him, she was instantly transformed into a golden statue, and the king was beside himself. It's a simple myth, maybe, But it's a good illustration of what can happen when we are not careful about our requests. We're really prone to see only the immediate, most pressing needs or wants that we have and to all but ignore the consequences, whether intended or unintended, of getting what we ask for. We just don't typically think it through. But God sees the whole picture. That's, that which to us seems needful or good may actually be the very thing that God knows will be harmful to us and destructive. And, and, and unlike a make-believe story, there are things and decisions that simply cannot be undone. And God, being a good father, is often very willing to let his children live with the consequences of our decisions in order to teach us and to shape our character. How often do we miss the good that he had for us by insisting on having our own way. 
I, I, I could tell you story after story in my own life of insisting on my own way and missing God's best for me. Be careful what you wish for. Think about James and John, the sons of Zebedee, when they came to Jesus and said, we want to sit at your right hand and at your left hand in glory. And they didn't even have any idea what they were asking for. <laughs> they didn't know what they were asking. They, they, just, they, they had this idea of what they wanted. And, and the danger of this adage, that, 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 that what, we, what we hope for, what we think we want, what we think we want and wish for, ends up not really meeting our expectations. Sometimes the results go beyond what we imagine. The, the, the results get twisted by sin. And we see and experience unintended consequences for the things that we want. There's a constant state of wanting and that constant state of just desiring and, 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 and grasping and wanting something uh, becomes the thing that ruins our satisfaction when we get it. It's really ironic. A perpetual looking forward to the future prevents us from appreciating what we have in the present. We see our wishes and our wants as we want them to be, but we don't see them clearly for what they actually will be when they come to us. It's the finiteness of man. It's the limitation of man. This is why we need a relationship with the living God, because he sees everything clearly. And he will advise us if we ask him, no, you don't really want that thing. So, oh, okay, if you say so, Lord. That's, a, that's wisdom. Ecclesiastes 5, 2 tells us, don't be quick with your mouth and do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God, because God is in heaven and you're on earth. So let your words be few. Yet God's our heavenly father but he wants us to experience fellowship and union with him. We need to consider how we approach him, especially when we want to make a request. And often there are those unintended consequences. So we got to be careful what we ask for. It's really the undercurrent of this section in 1 Samuel 8. So let's, let's look at the text this morning, being careful what we ask for. So, so verse 1 through 3, when Samuel had become old, he made his sons judges over Israel. Then the name of his firstborn son was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. And they were judges in Beersheba. Yet his sons did not walk in his ways, but they turned aside after gain. They took bribes and perverted justice. So Samuel ends up like Eli 2.0. You remember Eli's sons? They were worthless men. And now his sons have, have assumed the mantle of judges and they take bribes and they pervert justice. Their quality was known among the people. Now remember, uh, judgeship was not a hereditary reality. It wasn't an office you passed on to your kids. It wasn't supposed to be passed from father to son. If you go back to the actual book of Judges and you read about Gideon, Gideon actually refused this. When, when it was offered to him. Then Judges 8, 22 and 23, the men of Israel came to Gideon and they said, hey, you've been a great judge. Rule over us and your son and your grandson also. We want this to be a legacy and a dynasty and for your family on down to, to be rulers over us for you saved us from the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you and my son will not rule over you. The Lord will rule over you. So Gideon had it right. So take that good advice back into 1 Samuel, because there's no indication anywhere in the Bible that God appointed Samuel's two sons to the position of judge. More likely, it was assumed by them, or presumed, if you like. But this apparent development of a potential hereditary succession of judges was a new idea. It was not God's idea. Uh, though the time of judges is ending, uh, the idea that it's that's been seeded here is going to take root and it's going to grow. There's a foreshadowing here of what is to come for Israel in terms of hereditary descendancy in the kingship. And um, it doesn't get better and better and better. <laughs> in fact, it has the opposite uh, reality. But the judges were supposed to be incorruptible, not perfect, but incorruptible. Uh, this, this is Jethro speaking in Exodus 18. Jethro, if you'll remember, was the father-in-law of Moses who had some, some occasional really good wisdom for Moses as a leader. And so Jethro in Exodus 18 says, uh, verse 21, and he's speaking to Moses. He says, uh, moreover, look for able men from all the people, 
Men who fear God, who are trustworthy, who hate a bribe, and place such men over the people as chiefs of thousands and hundreds and fifties and of tens, and let them judge the people at all times. Every great matter they shall bring to you, but any small matter they shall, de they shall decide themselves. So it will be easier for you, and they will bear the burden with you. So this is a good idea, right? Plurality of eldership, plurality of judges. Uh, uh, Deuteronomy, in the, in the second giving of the law, uh, Deuteronomy 16, 18 to 20, Moses is the one speaking here. He says, and he's, he's repeating the words of God to the people of Israel. He says, you shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall sh not show partiality and you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. That's some wisdom right there. A bribe will, will uh, what does it say? Will, where'd it go? Where's my... <laughs> Oh, there it is. Uh, blinds the eyes of the wise. I lost my place. And subverts the cause of the righteous. And then he says, justice and only justice you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. What a great statement. Man, I feel like somebody needs to get up with a megaphone in Washington, D.C. and just repeat that passage until somebody gets it. Judges were supposed to be incorruptible. Now, Samuel might have remained faithful in that office, but his two sons were perverting justice. And the inclination towards unjust gain will inevitably lead a person to taking bribes if they continue in that way. Once the person's been corrupted by the taking of bribes, it's just a small step to perverting justice. It's not a big deal anymore. When civic leaders and judges and politicians pervert justice, it is an evil. But I'll tell you something, when religious leaders do it, that, that's a sign that society has entered a death spiral. When religious leaders are perverting justice, that's bad. That's really bad. And so look at verse 4 and 5. It says, Then all the elders of Israel gathered together, and they came to Samuel at Ramah, and they said to him, Behold, you're old. Thanks, guys. Thanks for telling me that. And your sons do not walk in your ways. Now appoint for us a king to judge us like all the nations. We want to be like the cool kids, right? So, so the elders come to Samuel they suggest that a monarchy is going to be effective in putting a stop to situations like the one with Samuel's two sons, which is just a pretext, really. It's not. I mean, corruption doesn't go away because you change the paradigm. Corruption only goes away when you change the heart of the person, which is why we need to be sharing the gospel. But, but God's not surprised. He's not caught off guard by this development. Because the Lord sees all, the Lord knows all, long before it comes to pass. And at the time he, he's giving the law to Moses and the nation of Israel, he already had this moment in mind. And you go back to Deuteronomy 17, verses 14 and 15, and listen to, what, listen to what he says. When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you, and you possess it and dwell in it, and then say, I want to set a king over me like all the nations that are around me. You may indeed set a king over you whom the Lord your God will choose. One from among your brothers, you shall set as king over you. You shall not put a foreigner over you who is not your brother. See, God, God foresaw this. He knew this. He's not surprised. He's not shocked. He knew this day was coming. He had set some boundaries in anticipation. Just because God saw that Israel was to have a king doesn't mean it was okay for Israel to demand a king. You understand the difference? Yeah, I provided for this for you, but you don't get to tell me what and when, right? God says, no, 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 I have a timetable. The fact that something is prophesied in Scripture is not proof that what is being foretold is good and right and pleasing to the Lord. The, the betrayal of Judas was foretold, as well as the fact that Israel would reject Christ as the Messiah. That doesn't mean any of, either of those two things were good or right before the Lord. It only means that God wants us to know that it's part of his eternal plan and that he's in control, even when feels, things feel like they're out of control for us. So, so this request for a king would fundamentally change the social and political structure of Israel, and it's going to impact the culture of that nation. So, so let's stop for a minute and talk about culture. Um, I, I, was, I was watching a couple of videos this week on that topic. What is culture? And culture is, this is the best definition I've ever heard. Culture is religion 
externalized. Because people live what they actually believe in their hearts. You can say you believe one thing, but how you live will tell me what you truly believe. And culture is just religion externalized. It's just simply living out your actual beliefs. Now, the people of God had carnal or fleshly motives. We want to be like the other nations. We want to be like the other kids in the neighborhood. It, it's, it's carnal motives have always, they always have unintended consequences. We can't see them. Remember we said, be careful what we ask for, right? God has called Israel out of Egypt into the promised land as a unique people, as a holy people set apart for his purposes, his express purposes. But what they're actually asking God to do is to do away with their special status and special relationship with him because they'd rather identify with the pagan nations. This is a the heinous insult to the one true and living God. I have it in my notes here. To, to, it says parallel the church at this moment in time. Just go ahead and think on that. How much the church is clamoring for the culture's attention and acceptance. It's sad. It's a sad day. Verse 6, but this thing displeased Samuel when they said, give us a king to judge us. And Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, obey the voice of the people and all that they say to you, for they've not rejected you, Samuel. They've rejected me from being king over them. You don't need to take it personally, bro. This is about me. According to all the deeds that they've done from the day that I brought them out of Egypt, even until this day, forsaking me and serving other gods, and so they are also doing to you. What'd you expect, bro? What'd you expect, Samuel? <laughs> they forsake me. You think they're going to be loyal to you? Now then, obey their voice. Only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who will reign over them. So note the interplay between the words. There's two words being, being juxtaposed here. Rejected forsaking, rejected, forsaking. Right, this is a continual reoccurrence of a choice God sets before humanity every day. Um, I, I take you to Joshua 24. Listen to this, Joshua 24, 14 and 15. You're listening for, uh, am I going to serve the Lord or am I going to forsake the Lord? Am I going to serve the Lord or, 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 or walk away, so reject the Lord, right? Rejecting and forsaking or are we serving? Joshua says, now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness and put away the gods that your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it's evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, then choose you this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your fathers and they served beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But Joshua says, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. We're going to serve the Lord. When you get to the book of Judges, it says uh, in Judges 2, 11, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord, and they served the Baals. I, just, I need to stop and tell you about Baal and, and, and Asherah. I won't go into it too much because there's young, young kids in the room. But this is, these are fertility cults. The way that you worshipped was to entice the priests and priestesses into um, fornication publicly. So that the gods, the male and female gods, would see that and go, whoa, yeah, let's, let's do that. And then they would send rain and, and prosperity on the earth, right? This, this is what the people of God were getting pulled into this stuff. And so in, Jerem, um, in, in Judges, it says, The people were serving the Baals, and they abandoned the Lord, the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt. They went after other gods from among the gods of the peoples who were around them. They bowed down to them, and they provoked the Lord to anger and abandoned the Lord and served the Baals and the Ashtoreth. So this isn't serving. This is abandoning. This is rejection. You get, to, you get to the prophets, you get to the guys like Jeremiah in Jeremiah chapter 5 because the Lord's promising a coming judgment on the people of Israel. And we see the same themes again in Jeremiah 5, 18 and 19. It says, but even in those days, declares the Lord, I will not make a full end of you. And when the people say, why has the Lord our God done these things to us? You shall say to them, as you have forsaken me and serve foreign gods in your land, so shall you serve foreigners in a land that's not yours. You want foreign gods? You want Baal and Ashtoreth and Molech and the gods of the Sidonians? Guess what? You can go live there. You can be their prisoners there. You can be their slaves. 
So this is a constant theme all through the Old Testament. And Samuel's caught in the middle. And this whole thing, it says in the text, is displeasing to him. Literally, the Hebrew says it was evil in his eyes. And we pretty safely assume Samuel's familiar with Deuteronomy 17. So then there's this weird question here that comes up. Why would Samuel be displeased about something that God had already said he was going to do? He's going to give him a king, right? We know that from Deuteronomy 17. Well, I think, I mean, we can only guess, but some possibilities might include Samuel feeling personally betrayed, uh, maybe taking offense at the wholesale rejection of the office of judges, or maybe Samuel's offended on behalf of God himself, or maybe all of those, but we don't know. But God reminds Samuel that it's not him the people are rejecting. It's God. It's God himself. And we see the Lord's response is largely more, what would you say, negative permission it's like, well, okay, if you're going to do that, moms and dads, you ever have that moment with your teenager? All right. All right. Well, if you're determined to do that, go, go ram your head against the wall, right? We, we, like the parents who've been through this stuff, we've experienced this stuff, we know this is not going to turn out well, but the only way you're going to learn this is to do it and to experience the pain of it. And so this is a negative permission, a relenting on the part of God, and not really a positive order, which God would say, go do this thing, right? This is more of a, okay, well, if you're determined, and, and it's not the people versus Samuel, it's the people versus God. Replacing God's direct rule with a person instead of God is a bad trade in every way imaginable. But the Bible tells us that mankind is prone to this kind of stuff. When, when you fast forward to the New Testament and you read the book of Romans, Right away in chapter one, Paul warns us about this. We are prone. He said, our, our hearts, uh, was a Martin Luther who said, our hearts are idol factories. We churn out idols all the time. Things we would rather worship and serve than the living God. So Paul says it this way in Romans 1.18. He says, because for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. Now, in order to, in order to suppress the truth, you've got to have what? The truth. So the truth is made available, right? You go back to Psalm 19. David says, the skies proclaim his handiwork. The, 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 the sun, moon, and stars testify to who God is. We have the truth and then Paul says in Romans 1, we suppress it because we're wicked and we don't want to give God glory. We want to worship all these other things. For his, in, his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So, so mankind's without excuse, Paul says. Though although, they, although they knew God, they didn't honor God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking. And their foolish hearts were darkened. And claiming to be wise, they actually became fools. Because they exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images resembling mortal man and birds and animals and creeping things. They worship false gods instead of the one true and living God. That's a bad trade. It's a bad trade. And before we move on from this bad trade, we'll, we'll take a, a, this idea of we'll take a man over God ruling us. It's important that we remember that humanity is not done with this continual contest whereby we as a, as a race of people continually choose man over God because it happens on the individual level every day in all of our lives in some capacity. We choose ourselves over God's way. Um, but it's also going to happen on the world stage, I think, very soon because mankind is now shouting for a new kind of leadership on the earth. I don't know if you're, if you're following this, if you're looking at these trends that are converging with each other, but instead of crying out for the one true and living God, mankind is crying out for Nietzsche's Superman to come and save us and lead us into a glorious future. The next step in the evolution of humanity, if you will. And, and that person is coming and he will do that, but it won't be God's man. He'll be Satan's man bought and paid for. Coming to a new world order near you very soon, I think. Um, every day we're getting closer and closer to the archetype of this colossal mistake. It's the same mistake being made here in 1 Samuel. It's the same mistake that humanity is about to make. We want a man to rule over us instead of God. We haven't learned. Verse 10. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking for a king from him. And he said, 
let me just warn you. These are going to be the ways of the king who will reign over you. Let me just tell you. He's going to take your sons and appoint them to his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots. He will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of all of your grain and of your vineyards and give them to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and the best of your young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day, you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, but the Lord will not answer you in that day. You're about to get what you want. You're about to get what you think you want. And you're going to find really quickly that it's not really what you wanted. You better be careful what you ask for. Remember the Newsboys song? Some of you, some of you adults in the room, when we, when we don't get what we deserve, it's a real good thing. And when we get what we don't deserve, that's a real good thing, Right? Unfortunately, the people of Israel are about to get precisely what they do deserve. So this section is basically a, a procedural discourse, like a manual of what kings would normally do. Not necessarily the kings of Israel, but just kings in general. This is what kings do. And so this is what you're about to get, guys. Um, on this issue, um, Solomon had something to say, which I think is really ironic when you look at Solomon's reign, because he was... He was almost totalitarian in, in terms of conscription and, and taking people to do whatever he wanted them to do. Uh, you consider how much taxation and conscription happened under his rule. This is ironic. But in Ecclesiastes 10, 5 through 7, uh, Solomon writes, There's an evil that I've seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in low places. And I've seen slaves on horses... And princes walking on the ground like slaves. So what this, what this means, um, our politicians were once known as civil servants. That used to be the term. We still use it. It doesn't mean anything anymore. Um, because they were agreeing, like Benjamin Franklin and, and, and the men at the Continental Congress, they were agreeing to give up their careers and interests for a season of their lives in order to serve the nation and give their full attention, energy, and resources to the needs and good of the people. So I'm going to put all that on hold so that I can serve the people for a season. And then I'm going to go back to my business and continue to do what I do. Not anymore. No, no, our politicians, inside track, insider trading, all the, like, how, how do people go from w the salary that congressional members make to being worth millions and millions of dollars? I just can't quite understand that. I don't, that's crazy to me. But this is not the case, right? Um, in, in, our, in our culture, this serving uh, for a season, it, it's always a mistake with people in authority, whether they ascend to a throne or whether they're appointed by someone or even elected by the pop, populace, uh, when they make their personal interests and affections more important than the needs of the people. That's a bad thing. And Solomon says he sees slaves on horses and princes walking around like slaves, which is to say that people uh, with very little wit and intelligence can and do sometimes find themselves in positions of political power, which ought to be filled by people who are noble and with good hearts and clear minds and clearer consciences, but aren't. But the inverse is true as well. There are many stout-hearted people with sound minds who go unrecognized who would do well in a position of governance. So it always goes ill for the people when vicious men are advanced to positions of power and men of great worth are kept down. Solomon calls this an evil, and, it's, and it is under the sun, right? And, and you go on. I'll give you another passage out of Ecclesiastes just to drive this stake in the ground. But uh, Ecclesiastes 10, 16, and 17, Woe to you, O land, when your king is a child and your princes feast in the morning. Happy are you, O land, when your king is the son of the nobility and your princess feasts at the proper time for strength, not for drunkenness. See, wo woe to you when your king is a child has almost nothing to do with the age of the person in the office and has more to do with their understanding and maturity. Imagine having Adam Sandler as president. That's what he's talking about. It's like, ah, ooh, ooh. Right? 
That kind of ruler is weak and foolish and fickle of heart. That kind of ruler is easily imposed upon and manipulated. Think, thinking of somebody who's easily manipulated, whose name will go unsaid. Uh, but it always goes ill with the people. It always goes ill with the people. It's not really much better when your princes feast in the morning. That kind of behavior indicates a slavery to personal appetites. Leaders who prioritize personal pleasure and prefer the gratifications of their flesh over and above and before the public good are not fit to lead. When rulers are generous and sober and sober minded, <laughs> temperate and wise, scripture tells us the land is blessed. When the king and the princes and governing officials are themselves governed by noble principles and virtues, the people thrive. And, and just as a personal reminder, our hope is not in an election, a new president, a new Congress. Our hope is not in any man or any woman or in any earthly government. Our hope is in the person of Jesus Christ and his soon return. So let's keep going here. First Samuel uh, 8, verse 19. But the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel. And they said, no, but there shall be a king over us so that we may be like all the nations and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And the people are like fussy, impudent little children. But I want it my way. All the other nations have a king. It's when the people of God act like a five-year-old who needs a nap is what's happening. Spank them and put them to bed. Right, consider what offense is being leveled against God. Who had fought all of Israel's battles? God had. Who had sent plagues of tumors and mice on the Philistines? Who, who had thundered from heaven and routed the Philistines? Who, who had been their ever-present help, especially in times of trouble? This is the one that they're now rejecting. They're saying, no, we don't want you who've only ever been faithful to us. We want a man to rule over us. And when Samuel heard this, verse 21, he heard all the words of the people. He repeated them in the ears of the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, obey their voice and make them a king. So Samuel said to the men of Israel, go every man to his city. Now, I believe that God is deliberately relenting on the timing and person in order to teach his people a lesson because he's already said he has an intent to set a king in office. It's not the person he wants. It's not the right timing, but he's relenting to teach them a lesson. This, this, this whole thing happened because the people refused to listen to the Lord, which actually amounts to distrust of God on the part of God's people. That's a bad sign of things to come. They don't trust the Lord. Well, who else can you trust if you can't trust the Lord? So let's go back and unpack some realities from this text that have direct application for us. Number one is this. Carnal motives, fleshly motives, lead to unintended consequences. Every time. Every time. They may be delayed for a while. You may not see them or experience them for a while. But when your motive is to do something in the flesh, something sinful, there are unintended consequences every time. Now, carnal carne, flesh, right? As opposed to being in the spirit. Um, the people of God were not under, in, or submitted to the spirit in this matter. They were clearly operating in the flesh. They weren't thinking about God. They weren't thinking about his will or his ways. They were thinking about themselves and what they wanted and what they thought was best. But their perspective was skewed because of sin. And it was incomplete. So God had a plan. He had a way. He had a timing. But they didn't want to wait upon the Lord. How many of us can relate to that? God's got a plan. He's got a way he wants to do it. His timing is perfect. Yeah, but could you just hurry up? Who said that? He knows what he's doing. They're, they're having, his people are having a tantrum. This is their, their, this is their Veruca Salt moment to borrow from Willy Wonka. I want it now. I want it now. Right? Just throw in a little tantrum. How easy is it, even for the people of God, to forget that when carnality infects our thinking and our decision-making, there are always consequences, many of which are unintended and unforeseen. We, we, just, we just blow past that and forget about it because we're so set on what we want. So, Carnal motives lead to unintended consequences. And here's the next one. Sin leads to the erosion of authority. It erodes authority. And now no person is perfect. 
That's a foregone conclusion. But, but there was a time in our, in our culture's history when we appointed and elected men and women who were worthy to lead. Men and women of godly character who were committed to doing what was right and releasing people from constraints that kept them from flourishing. Sowing to the flesh and reaping corruption. We, we, we elected people who wanted to move away from corruption, away from those things. Now, sin, but sin has consequences. It has personal consequences. Sin has, did you know this? Sin has physical consequences. It will mess with your, your physicality. Sin has national consequences, as we're seeing at this moment. Sin has global consequences. Last of all, but not least of all, it has personal consequences for us and, and, and eternal consequences if, if we're not careful, if we're not calling out to the Lord Jesus day in and day out. When enough people are sowing to the flesh, it, it accumulates uh, a kind of corruption that becomes inescapable for a culture. Uh, it was John MacArthur, I was reading John, Johnny Mac this week, he said, there are 1,189 chapters in the Bible and only four of them do not involve a sin-cursed world. The first two and the last two. Before sin and after sin. Before the fall and the new heavens and the new earth. Everything in between is just a, the history of sowing and harvesting sin and corruption. Whoa. Only four chapters in the whole Bible don't have to do with sin. The whole story of the Old Testament is a story of sin and corruption. Sin has built-in consequences. This is why the Apostle Paul reminds us to run towards God. He says in, in his letter to the Romans in chapter 12, I appeal to you, brothers. I beg you. I urge you. By the mercies of God, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, because that's your spiritual worship. Do that. Don't be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your minds so that by testing, you might begin to discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. That's what God wants for us. Goodness and things that he accepts and that he, he cherishes. He wants those things for us. Carnal motives lead to unintended consequences and sin leads to the erosion of authority. And then here's the next one. This progression that I'm describing to you leads people away from God and into worldliness. When this is happening at a cultural level, it will lead people away from God and into worldliness. Remember, culture is religion externalized. It's an expression of what people actually believe. L listen to these warnings in Proverbs 28. This is just some excerpts from, from that chapter. When the land transgresses, it has many rulers, but with a man of understanding and knowledge is stability and, and long life or, or continue in safety or continue in stability for a long time. Uh, verse four, Proverbs 28 says, those who forsake the law praise the wicked, but those who keep the law strive against them. Evil man don't understand justice, but those who seek the Lord understand it completely. Man, you talk about a word that's bandied about in our culture today that people don't know what it means. Try justice without throwing any words in front of justice. Let's just talk about justice. Same chapter, Proverbs 28, 12. When the righteous triumph, there's great glory. And when the wicked rise, people hide themselves. You know, people are moving to Montana. I just want to live out where nobody can find me. I want to build a bunker in the ground and live in it so nobody can find me. 15, like a roaring lion or a charging bear is a wicked ruler over a poor people. A ruler who lacks understanding is a cruel oppressor, but he who hates unjust gain will prolong his days. I could go on and on and on in the book of Proverbs, but carnal motives, fleshly motives, selfish motives bring unintended consequences. And this progression builds up and it begins to lead people away from God and into more worldliness. And in Western civilization right now, Western culture, our culture uh, has shifted dramatically in the last 50 years. We should be asking what does our culture really believe? As evangelists and people of God in the world, in the workplace, we should be asking this question. What does our culture really believe? Now, it used to be a Judeo-Christian, generally a Judeo-Christian culture. It is not. We are post-post-Christian. We're not just post-Christian. We're post-post-Christian. We're pagan. We're a pagan culture. 
So what does our culture really believe? Let me give you three big things this morning just to stir your mind in this way of thinking as you begin to look around at the culture, look around at the people around you in our community, in our town, in, in Washington State. Here are three big ones I want to challenge you to take a hard look at. Uh, we're looking th- through the lens of God. Um, here's number one. Equity and equality are confused and conflated. They become confused and conflated. There's a common misconception that equity and equality mean the same thing and that they can be used interchangeably. But the truth is they do not mean the same thing and they cannot be used interchangeably without doing great damage to our whole society. Equity, excuse me, equality means we have equal value. You and I are of equal value under the law and in the sight of God. We are equals. I'm not of any more worth or value than any of you. We have equal value. We are equal in the sight of God. Equity means something altogether different. Equity equity requires equality being applied to everything in our lives and culture. It all has to be equal. It all has to be the same. It all has to be the same measure. If you got even like one iota more, you, you think you're better than us and like kill that person, right, on social media and maybe really in in life. But um, equity and equality, equity requires equality be applied to every category of life. Equity is we all have to have the same amount. We all have to have the same outcome. This philosophy posits that there cannot be any equality until there is equity. One of the tiny minor little problems with this view is the sheer mind-boggling amount of bureaucracy and government intrusion it required to to manage a system to keep equity in place. I don't want that. I don't want a totalitarian regime managing equity. At this very moment, a chorus of voices in Western civilization is clamoring for equity, and that chorus continues to grow and grow. But what else does our culture believe? Well, we believe equity and equality are are conflated, they're the same, basically the same. We need both. And then here's, here's the next one. People must atone for their own sins. Now, you, you could ask people if they believe that, and they'd probably say, well, no, not really, maybe, I don't know. They wouldn't know. But the way that we, what we're, we're looking at is how that belief is actually externalized and lived, right? Because with biblical Christianity in steep decline, notice I said biblical Christianity, because progressive Christianity is doing just fine. Um, Biblical Christianity and steep decline, people are left more and more with nothing and no one who can atone for their sins. There's no atonement. And that's a hard place to be because until a heart's been thoroughly hardened by sin over time, there's still this built-in feature called the conscience that reminds us that we're, we've fallen short of God's glorious and perfect standard. And so there's this innate sense in people that our good has to outweigh or at least balance out with our bad and our sin and, and so everybody knows deep down they're a sinner. They just don't know what to do about it. Without Jesus as Savior and w- without Jesus as atoning sacrifice, people are left to themselves and their sorry attempts at being good enough for God, th- the God they don't even really know. So if Jesus is not your atonement, you've got to find something else to be your atonement. And this is, makes people tremendously insecure. So, so we've got this situation. We've got um, equity and equality confused. We, we got people trying to atone for their own sins. And then here's the third one. My observation is there is no God who meets out justice, so we have to claim it for ourselves. See, so we don't believe in a transcendent God who made heaven and earth, who will, who will ju- judge the living and the dead and see that every person gets justice. That's not a belief. So because equity is not actually achievable and sins have to be atoned for, this impacts justice. Justice for many is about making sure that people who hurt them or damage me get what they deserve. That's retribution. That's not not always justice. But nobody stops to think about what they themselves deserve, having wronged the God who made them. Those who know God can navigate these situations because we know that no one ultimately escapes justice and that God's the one who sees to that. But I can easily show you the reality of the belief that justice is not actually available in this life as it manifests in our culture. Maybe you're, maybe you're thinking, I'm not sure I believe that one, Sadie. Uh, let, me, let me show you where this is in our culture. You watch any big national court case in the national news cycle, in the media cycle, and then pay attention to the outcome when it doesn't line up with public, public opinion as prescribed by the media. It, the outcome, Rittenhouse, the outcome did not match what the media said it ought to be. 
and people flipped out. They just flipped out. People go insane. All the looting and rioting and rampaging the past two or three years in our country is proof positive that we're a culture that does not believe justice is assured by God in this life or the next. As people have to go and get justice for themselves. Hence, those who believe that reality must take justice in their own hands to see it done. If your worldview excludes a perfectly just and wise God, the people who feel that justice hasn't been done become vigilantes out of necessity. These are just three simple examples of the reality that culture is not neutral. When man rejects God's authority, man becomes his own God. And American culture is thoroughly pagan and the church is wavering right now as to which way it should go. That is even considering the question is a bad sign. What are we, what are we talking about this for? Biblical culture is the only culture in which the state is restrained and that by God, not by man. Because Jesus is either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. There's not, there's not any middle ground on this, folks. Sometimes the people of God have got to stop and ask the question, do we want the culture or do we want the one true and living God? Be careful what you ask for. Be careful what you ask for. The culture is increasingly wanting an earthly king, not a heavenly king. Be careful what you ask for. Worldliness can never sustain itself. This leads to people calling out for order and justice and for someone to rule over them. There's, there's a growing desperation for justice and order, and people are beginning to call out. We need somebody to just, who can bring this all together and rule over us and lead us. And this call for a new world order, the clamor for safety is about feeling secure. I want to feel secure. I want to feel safe. And, and this clamor for peace and that peace and security. Peace and safety. I just encountered that somewhere before in God's word. Oh, First Thessalonians 5. It's right here in my notes, oddly enough. Um, concerning the times and seasons, brothers, you don't need to have anything written to you. You yourselves are fully aware that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people are saying, literally in the Greek, when they're clamoring, crying out for peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as labor pains come upon a pregnant woman, and they will not escape. But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief. Don't dwell in darkness. Live in the light. You will see the day approaching. There's a coming world leader who will usher in peace and security, but there will be a false peace and security, and that will be short-lived. This is the coming Antichrist. He's coming soon. Soon. Do you want this world? Do you want this culture? Or do you want the one true and living God? We've got to be careful what we ask for. Church, we stand at a crossroads. Our current national leadership has at its head a man who is in cognitive decline and unable to fill his duties as POTUS. Every day there are more and more wars and rumors of wars. Even yesterday, um, we think Israel struck Iran's nuclear facility for the third time. Russia stands on the border of Crimea in, in Ukraine, ready to invade with troops. China is just waiting for Taiwan to do something so that they can invade. We stand on the brink of global war. There's more wars and rumors of wars. That can only go on for so long until it spills over, over into, into a reality. And our freedoms are being eroded and totalitarianism is on the horizon. And we need to be careful what we ask for in these days. Because again, our hope is not in an election it's not in men. It's not in earthly government. Our hope is in the person and work of Jesus Christ and his soon return for the church. Maranatha. Maranatha. Come soon, Lord Jesus. Amen. Father, we pray in, in your name this morning. We cry out to you. You are what we want more than anything else. Be careful what we ask for. We, we've, we've thought this through and we're saying to you this morning, we want you. More than anything else in this world, we want you. We want to be filled by your spirit. We want to be emboldened to share the gospel with those who are lost. We don't want another day to go by that we would waste the opportunity to preach the gospel, to share Jesus with those around us. Lord, give us creativity and, and give us an unction in our spirit that would overcome our fear that we would move forward in relationships and in conversations and in sharing the gospel. We love you. We want you to be known. We want our neighbors and our friends to know you. 
So, Father, give us strength. Give us uh, your will and your way and fill us with your spirit. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. You know, culture is, culture, our culture is just our religion externalized. Any culture that gives into carnality experiences unintended consequences. This, all this moving in this direction is just symptomatic of, of a rejection of God's kingship. Amen. And so we see this pattern reaching its fullness in our culture today. There's a growing outcry for a new world order to shake off the restraints of the Judeo-Christian ethic and God himself. We're, we're, we're wanting to replace God's rule with a man. And we're just repeating history. So with the time you have left, don't waste it. Don't waste it. Spend it on loving people well. Speak the gospel truth while you can. It's the one thing you can't do in heaven. So do it now. Amen. A Maestro Church, you are sent. Oh, Christmas Eve, hang on. Thank you, Georgia. Saving the day. Christmas Eve service right here, 4 p.m. Right here. Uh, no, it's at the Grange. It's at the Grange. We're at the Grange for Christmas Eve. We're with River of Life. We're going to do that together. So join us at the Grange Christmas Eve. It's going to be great. We can light candles, and we don't have to worry about burning anything down. It's going to be fun play with fire. See you Christmas Eve.